We know people generally have an order they rank Hove's albums in, and even if it varies slightly, this is definitely not your typical list. When discussing greatest rappers of all time, Jay's name is often at the forefront of these conversations. Given the degree to which he's mastered his craft over the past three decades, this is essentially a two-part ranking. One half being a breakdown of albums that will fill out the majority of his discography, and the other half being a ranking of what we consider to be classic material. So sit back, grab some popcorn, hit that like and subscribe buttons, and enjoy. Number 13, the blueprint to the gift and the curse. While many people usually reserve this spot for Kingdom Come, we must point out how the blueprint 2 was so disappointing, Jay rolled out 2.1 less than six months later, the only re-release of his ongoing 13 album career. Fully titled the blueprint 2 the gift and the curse, the double LP was about 75% curse, 25% gift. Keep in mind, he just delivered what many consider to be his magnum opus in the blueprint, only increasing the expectations by announcing an immediate sequel. We can't blame Jay for following the trends of the time, but it was his trend setting that made the blueprint such a pivotal release. Lauded for its consistency, limited guest appearances, and compact delivery, the blueprint maximized impact while minimizing filler. Blueprint 2 diametrically opposed everything its predecessor represented. Back in 2013, Jay would cite this as his second worst album, stating he should have been more selective with the green light on song. Containing more than two dozen tracks, the nearly two hour long commitment of an album revels in its overabundance while trying to capitalize off of the moment's most popular musical act. We get some collabs that work, like Beyonce on 03, Bonnie and Clyde, an uncredited Pharrell hook on Excuse Me Miss, and a surprise appearance from Rakim on The Watcher 2. However, the album is littered with clashing features and production styles that you wouldn't expect to see from a rookie, let alone the seasoned vet seven albums in, who was arguably the sole face of hip hop at the time. Production and a guest appearance from Dr. Dre on The Watcher 2 was just a miss. Dre was trying to find the direction of his next era of beats and basically used Jay as a guinea pig before rolling out in the club with 50. For some reason, Jay, Dame, and Biggs thought it would make sense to throw Sean Paul on what they gonna do, quickly removing the song on 2.1. But that last half of the curse, as one, not only wasted a perfectly good Earth, Wind, and Fire sample, but it did irreparable damage to the posse cut as a whole. The album would debut at number one with 545,000 first week sales, being Jay's third highest mark to date. That being said, even the worst Jay-Z album is bound to have some solid offerings and hidden gems. Tracks like I Did It My Way, Hovey Baby, Poppin' Tags, and Somehow Some Way are the clearest definitions of diamonds in the rough you'll find throughout his discography. Somehow Some Way would mark Jay's last collaboration with Houston OG Scarface, which might be the saddest part of this whole project. Blueprint 2 is currently triple platinum, a testament to Jay's greatness that even the most forgettable entry into his catalog would still be a commercial peak for a lot of his peers. Let us know if we're reaching with this one, but in the three songs Jay-Z, Scarface, and Kanye West came together for, we got this can't be life, guess who's back, and somehow some way. Are we the only ones who would have wanted to see a seven song EP from the trio? Maybe even a full LP upgrade like Watch the Throne. Share your thoughts with us down below. Oh, and yes, we almost forgot. The title track on disc two, those Nas bars went crazy. Yes, the war was already lost and naming it after the album didn't help give it an identity, but that shit was hard. Okay, now we can move on. Number 12, Magna Carta. Coupled with his most unconventional rollout to date, Magna Carta's emphasis on wealth, art, and opulence accentuate a stark change in sound and subject matter from the Brooklyn born. Stark change might be a bit dramatic after all. These are all topics he touched on more prominently inside his collab album with Ye Watch the Throne. The difference with this one was the amount of time he devoted to putting us on game and the fallout from his hip hop peers. Even addressing it in a slight flare up between him and Drake on this version of We Made It with Jay Electronica. Come to think of it, this was a very precarious time in his career. Stepping out on a limb, Jay secured a distribution deal of sorts with Samsung, giving away a million free copies to Galaxy users who downloaded the Jay-Z Magna Carta app. The promotional deal came with commercials that shared details of the album, viral scavenger hunts that laid out the track list, along with an album cover reveal that involved the actual Magna Carta being found next to the one of the four surviving copies in England. Billboard was quick to disqualify the promotion, saying the sales wouldn't count toward his sound scan numbers. But what did Hove do? Put the album out for retail sales to three days later, and to no one's surprise, it still went number one. Moving 528K in its first week, Jay would go on to dispel allegations of cheating the system on the Rap Radar podcast, telling BDOT and Elliot Wilson that even when Billboard moved the goalposts, Holy Grail secured his 10th straight chart topper by crushing their own metrics. With more Timberland involvement than ever, Hove also taps Pharrell, Mike Dean, No ID, and more behind the boards. Hove utters his first tangible aspirations of being a billionaire on Picasso Baby. He joins 
Voices with Frank Ocean on the aptly titled Oceans, letting the world know the only Christopher we acknowledge is Wallace. He dishes 5% of knowledge on Heaven, and he and B put out their best collaboration to date on Wax with Part 2, which spawned the On The Run tour of the same name. The record is certainly not without its flaws. In addition to the negative critical feedback the tape would receive, many people have thrown the commercial tag on the album, claimed Hove's insistence on generational wealth got a bit overbearing, and honestly, some of these misses are his most notable of his career. Crown is a skip, and the BBC record with Nas is easily their worst collab. But collectively, the album would definitely surprise listeners who haven't given it a re-listen since its first downloads a decade ago. We've got a theory we like to point out. After every Hove classic, we confuse reinvention with underperformance. Why is that? In this case, Holy Grail followed up Watch the Throne, but we saw it with Kingdom Come and The Blueprint 3. Were these albums really as bad as they said? We'll leave that up for you to decide. Number 11, Kingdom Come. By no means a great project, Kingdom Come had unrealistic expectations from the jump. After releasing his universally applauded farewell with the Black Album, Jay's return looked a lot like MJ on The Wizards. Still productive, but not the same. While the album certainly fell apart in its third act with back-to-back -back duds and anything featuring Usher and Hollywood with Beyonce, its most detrimental impact was the eraser of his storybook ending. Anticipation for Hove's comeback was so great that Kingdom Come would sell a career high 680,000 copies its first week, easily securing his seventh number one in a row. Following a DC comic storyline a decade earlier, Kingdom Come paints the backdrop of a dystopian hip hop that's reeling from Jay's absence. Only his retirement was more like a small vacation, dropping two collab albums in just over three years time, including Unfinished Business with R. Kelly, which made fans wish he stuck to retirement. We all knew that someone who had dropped eight albums in seven years wasn't really going to retire for good. After getting such a detail-oriented send off with the Black Album, it was a safe bet that Jay wouldn't roll out an unfinished product. Kingdom Come just wasn't that lightning in a bottle. Sonically, this album was all over the place. Dr. Dre had four beats on this joint and mixed all 14 songs. Just Blaze might have been at the peak of his powers with Oh My God, Kingdom Come, and Show Me What You Got, easily securing his spot on the Mount Rushmore of Hove production. Don't forget on Show Me What You Got, Jay said he was coming back for the throne, so imposters needed to vacate. Wayne sent Doe Is What I Got Back and had Hove feeling like Brady coming out of retirement for nothing. Kanye even got behind the boards on the John Legend assisted Do You Wanna Ride? And while these songs on their own would be gems in Jay's catalog, mashing them up created obvious riffs in the album's chemistry. His subject material and delivery were also pretty inconsistent, giving long shots like 30-something or air balls like Trouble. Receiving mixed reviews from critics and generally abysmal ones from fans, Kingdom Come held the rare distinction of being overly criticized and underdeveloped. Less than a year later, Sean Carter would drop one of his most polished efforts with American Gangster. Kingdom Come ironically made American Gangster possible, transitioning him back to more of a reasonable doubt archetype of himself. Yet Kingdom Come finding itself between the Black Album and American Gangster has only solidified its spot in Jay-Z purgatory. Them first six to seven tracks had it looking just as solid as any of his In My Lifetime albums, but the last half made it that easy to forget. If Kingdom Come was him shaking the rust off to get back in shape, we're fine with that. And Hove, if you're watching, can you put Dig a Hole back on streaming sites? Asking for a friend. Number 10, Volume 3, Life and Times of S. Carter. Jay's third installment in the Lifetime series would be his first album debut atop the chart, starting a streak that's currently 10 entries deep, solo albums only, of course. Alluding to the business acumen he was developing on Volume 2, Jay opens up Hova Interlude, claiming to be the ghetto's answer to Trump. Another thing to note on that same interlude, Jay refers to Beans and Bleak as his Peter and Paul. Religious imagery and symbolism that would follow him on projects like the Black Album, Kingdom Come, and Magna Carta. Volume 3 would mark the last time we'd get a Jay and Primo collab, while also laying the groundwork for Dirt Off Your Shoulder with Timbaland. Nostalgic feelings aside, outside of Big Pimpin, there's very little to come back to on this one. Following up his most commercially successful album to date in Volume 2, Life and Times is more concerned with moving records than making statements. Jay's creativity takes a dip and the replay value suffers for it. So Ghetto, Dope Man, and Come and Get Me, while solid, feel like placeholders rather than impactful tracks on a memorable album. Is That Your Chick, an unofficial Nas disc, has some of the most disrespectful bars Jay has ever spit. Especially that second verse. Jesus. Back to Big Pimpin' though. That song reminds us of 0203 Tracy McGrady, putting up numbers for a first round exit. We think Jay's apparent relaxed demeanor and subject matter would start to snowball into the idea that his subject material was surface level, which he would go on to address on 99 Problems. The album would also see some fuel being added to the fire with Jay throwing shots, no pun intended, at 50 on It's Hot. Volume 3 sees the first real iteration of The Rock, with Beans, Bleak, and Emil appearing on their first track together on Pop for Rock. If you know Jay and his fight for sampling, then you know just how much time he spent in court over licensing.
licensing. In 2007, Jay would get hit with a lawsuit over the alleged unlicensed use of a sample on Big Pimpin'. When testifying years later on the case, Jay was asked why he did not check the rights to the sample's use. His reply, it's not what I do, I make music. It would ultimately be ruled in Jay's favor back in 2018. Fun fact, the music video for Big Pimpin' was shot during Carnival in Trinidad. Pimp C refused to fly out there, so his portion of the video was filmed in Florida. When asked why he was wearing a mink coat in 90 degree Miami heat, his response, TV ain't got no temperature. Well, he's got a point. Apparently he wasn't feeling the beat either, so we're just grateful for the eight bars we got out of the classic collaboration. Number nine, The Dynasty, Rock La Familia. The Dynasty album is arguably a sleeper for both Jay's most influential and forgettable albums. Kanye's high-pitched I Miss You sample on This Can't Be Life would come to be known as Chipmunk Soul, a term allegedly coined by Questlove. Becoming his signature production style, it would set the stage for Ye's retooling of the early 2000s hip-hop and R&B, including The Blueprint. More on that later. Off of our most recent listens, we caught G Herbo flipping the classic Dynasty intro on his opener to PTSD, Ross ripping the Where Have You Been outro in the scathing Idols Become Rivals, and Quavo and Takeoff grabbing that 1900 Hustler beat on their intro track to Infinity Links. Rest in peace, Take. In addition to sporting Ho's first collabs with both Kanye and the Neptunes, Rock La Familia would essentially serve as a giant drawing board for new ideas. Its duality is both celebrated and swept under the rug for reasons many Ho fans would rather forget or fail to remember. With I Just Wanna Love You, Streets is Talking, and This Can't Be Life forming a three-headed juggernaut, the Dynasty album already positions itself ahead of Blueprint 2 in Volume 3. Unfortunately, not all of the first explored on this tape had positive career implications. Functioning as an unofficial sequel to Dope Man on Volume 3, Jigga and Kells assert they're innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, scratch that. Guilty till proven innocent. Yeah, that one really didn't age well. The track would lead to a pair of collab albums and a tour with the Pied Piper of the Penitentiary. Originally drawn up as a Rockefeller compilation album, Rock La Familia ended up in Hove's hands being marketed as his fifth studio album. While the project did receive positive reviews at the time, in high Insight, we think Hove should have took the year off for more quality control. At this point of his career, Jigga had dropped the studio album every year for a half decade. So yes, the Dynasty album had some heat on it. Soon you'll understand on line one. But collectively, the album sounds like a fatigued Jay struggling to keep up with demand. Recycling Biggie on Squeeze first, posse cut misses like You, Me, Him, and Her, and the feature count of a compilation album, the Dynasty only barely cracks the top 10, mainly due to its inability to meet impact with influence. Number eight, volume two, Hard Knock Life. Hove's third studio album occupies the most distinctive spot in his discography. Initially enjoying widespread critical acclaim, most fans would tell you it belongs in the discussion of some of his greatest. While it is his most commercially successful, currently sitting on five platinum plaques, the critical side of the project is certainly dated. Coming from lifelong Jay-Z fans, we get it. Very few albums have slapped like Volume 2 did in 98, coming out of the woofers you had in the trunk. But when's the last time you heard joints like If I Should Die, Can I Get A, Nigga What, Nigga Who, or Ride or Die? Some of these tracks sound like perfectly preserved time capsules, but not in the best way. The project has some captivating moments for sure, with tracks like Money Cash Holes, A Week Ago, and Hard Knock life still slapping even by today's standards. But when seeing the heights Jay would soon reach, volume two sounds like a cap on potential rather than an opportunity for growth. Three albums in, we get our first mentions of a possible retirement from Jay. When comparing this one to volume one, we can certainly hear some love loss for the art. Mark the 4-5 King only producing Hard Knock Life is criminal. Considering he would also go on to gift Eminem Stan, his potential contributions to the project make us question why he wasn't tapped for more beats. Reservoir Dogs uses a dope sample of the shaft theme by Isaac Hayes, but it's about four voices too many. Jigga and Jada trading bars would have worked better than cramming six verses on the five minute track. Production from Swizzy, Timbaland, and Jermaine Dupri leaves listeners confused as to what era they're hearing. We don't get the same productivity from Primo either, Hand It Down just didn't have the impact of Rhyme No More. Being unusually top heavy, catalog staples are few and far between. Missing the storytelling of volume one and lacking the pop crossover of volume three, the middle entry into the Lifetime series is kind of middle of the Road. We would soon see Jay start to come into his own as an artist and executive producer, crafting full projects instead of building around a song or two. Volume 2 would also be Jazz O's last credit on a whole project after playing crucial roles on Reasonable Doubt and Volume 1. Volume 2 Hard Knock Life would win the Grammy for Best Rap Album in 99. Jay boycotted that ceremony, demanding more respect and recognition for the rappers that the Academy continually overlooked. We find it wild that he won for Best Rap Album and not Best Solo Rap Performance for the song that he sent 
eventually introduced him to mainstream America. Number seven, volume one in my lifetime. While shiny suit era samples do hit different, Jigga's transition from mafioso to Jiggy is abrupt and jarring at times. Volume one would be the first project Jay dropped after Big's death, so we'll give him a pass for the album's shaky footing. Because while people tend to remember letdowns on an album, it's rare to appreciate new qualities of the sleepers. That intro and shift into Rhyme No More from A Million and One Questions is our pick for Hov's best album opener. Yeah, we said it. The way Teddy, Jay, and Blackstreet infuse the void of Big's absence into City of Mind is almost eerie. While the record would get off to a strong start, it would hit a major speed bump early, highlighting an issue that would plague him until the blueprint. You could tell Jay's ear for sequencing hadn't developed, placing I Know What Girls Like in between the City is Mine and Imaginary Players. From a sonic perspective, however, we're talking samples, mixing and mastering, the production team deserves a round of applause. Primo on the intro, Teddy did his thing on City is Mine, Prestige on Imaginary Players, Big Jazz and Amon Ra on Rap Game and Where I'm From respectively. This releases a rough formula of the level of detail we would get throughout future albums. Sunshine is probably Jay's most polarizing record to date, that or Tom Ford. All we'll say is Sunshine is not a bad song, just a bad song to appear on the follow-up to Reasonable Doubt. Speaking of Reasonable Doubt, shout out to returning producer Ski for hooking up the Who You With 2 and Streets is Watching Beats, coming in clutch and consistent. The album cleans up nicely though, Rap Game slash Crack Game, Where I'm From, and You Must Love Me display for audiences what Jay's sophomore effort could have been at its peak. I mean, the storytelling on You Must Love Me is essential Jay-Z to its core. In My Lifetime Volume 1 would be Jay's last album not to debut at number one. Keep in mind this album is 26 years old. Talk about longevity. We think the real hang up for the 97 LP lies in the bad boy heavy sound that conflicted with his natural style. Oh yeah, we forget about Face Off and Lucky Me, and you blame us though. When you average this project out from its highs, lows, and everything in between, it perfectly fits in the middle of its catalog. Not as prestigious as The Blueprint or American Gangster, but not as repetitive as Life and Times and The Blueprint too. When's the last time y'all saw that City of Mind music video with Michael Rappaport? It's interesting to see Jay using the usual suspects as inspiration for this video rather than something off reasonable doubt. But let us know what you think in the comments. Number six, Blueprint 3. We're gonna paraphrase here, but if you like his old music, then buy his old albums. Who remembers that dope Rhapsody commercial where Jay recreated all his album covers? That was a genius way of marketing the Blueprint 3's arrival. BP3 was a complete overhaul of anything he had done before. Four. No face on the cover, a polished futuristic sound, and two of the next generation's brightest prospects. Hove had a crystal ball when he made this joint. Instead of using Photoshop to make the album cover, Hove and his team stacked real instrumentals and used a projector to get the right perspective. Sean entered 40 triumphantly with bold cuts like Run This Town, On To The Next One, and Young Forever. With Off That, we get Post So Far Gone Drizzy before him and Ye locked in for Thank Me Later. Maybe even more noteworthy than that, A Star Is Born is the first time we see Cole appearing on a national stage. Not everything Jay experimented with worked on here. The up-tempo tech production hit a wall on Venus versus Mars, falling flat and halting the album's momentum. Jay explained his process to Rolling Stone, stating that he takes contributions from multiple producers as long as they contribute greatness, which can explain his occasionally incohesive sounds. We gotta give Hove his props for Empire State of Mind, juxtaposing Nas' version of a New York State of Mind, Jay and Alicia perfectly translate the image us outsiders have into Jay's only solo number one hit. We can't lie though, Young Jeezy was the surprise performance on this album. Real as it gets, sounds, feels, and hits like a Jeezy track. Jay shouldn't have gave Jeezy the hook and verse. That was a two-piece combo. Now you can't convince us otherwise that Jay isn't the feature. Hove would end up beating himself at the 52 and 53rd Grammys, winning a combined six awards from singles off the album. His record-breaking 11th number one album held more milestones than we knew at the time. Real quick, there's a couple of flowers we want to give out. No ID went crazy on this joint, grabbing producer credits on the first four songs, while Ye would put a stamp on Run This Town and Young Forever. We're glad Jay could redeem himself from Blueprint 2, leaving the series a net positive. Fun fact, we thought it was cool how Jay mentioned buying a Jeep and taking the doors off on the song on On To The Next One. If you recall, Jay and Kanye would buy and customize a Maybach 57 while shooting their now iconic Otis video. Indeed, taking the doors off. It's also funny that he mentioned the passing of the torch to Wayne in A Star Is Born like he hadn't already snatched it on Doe Is What I Got. Before we get to the top five albums from the GOAT Jay-Z, we must inform you that we are now entering the classic zone. Only a select few artists have discographies that hold multiple classics to where the order of these could vary depending on the time of day. But for this list, on whatever day you're watching this, here's our order. 
Number five, American Gangster. If we're being honest with ourselves, we all know this was Jay's real return following the disenchanting release of Kingdom Come. Heavily inspired by the film of the same name, Hove envisions his story replacing titular character Frank Lucas. Quite frankly, it's a masterpiece. Diddy and the Hitmen took that criticism from I Know What Girls Like personally. The sound behind this album is dazzling and illustrious in ways only Puff could evoke. Listen to joints like Rock Boys, Sweet, and Party Life, and tell us you don't want to throw a black tie gathered on a yacht off the coast. I mean, what better way to sum up the 70s than incorporating flawless samples from the likes of Marvin Gaye, Barry White, Rudy Love, and Curtis Mayfield. The album feels like it ties up a lot of loose ends. It makes sense seeing as this will be his last release under Def Jam. On Ignorant Shit, Jay addresses baseless criticisms that were being hurled at him since volume two, intentionally dumbing down his message to prove a point regarding his lose-lose position with fans and critics alike. Sticking to the essentials, Hove gets features from Wayne, Beans, and Nas, all perfectly placed by the way. Can't forget the uncredited Pharrell hooks on I Know and Blue Magic. Remember when we were talking about turbulent times throughout Jay's career? We think these intentional and strategic features highlight just how calculating Jay can be through troubled waters. Instead of competing with Tunchi for the best rapper alive crown, Hove puts more of a mentor-mentee relationship in place, securing what would be the first of several tracks they would share together. After recently mending tensions with peer turned foe turned friend, Nas appearing on success feels like the perfect trade-off for Hove featuring on Black Republican. Let us know in the comments which song do you prefer? And of course, Beans gracing a J track list for the first time since Blueprint 2 was an attention grabber in itself. American Gangster would be Jay's 10th number one album, tying him with Elvis for second most. As far as the first person perspective, mafioso storytelling rap goes, American Gangster certainly gives reasonable doubt a run for its money. With a decade's worth of experience and countless reinventions, Jay taps into a space of maturity and wisdom far beyond his years. When we say the album is polished and silky, we're not just talking production. These are easily some of Jay's smoothest deliveries and schemes throughout a storied 30 year career. Equal parts successful both critically and commercially, American Gangster would sell over a million copies just a month after its release. The album would be met with universal acclaim, landing toward the top of even Jay's own rankings of his catalog. We'll give a slight edge to Reasonable Doubt because of its impact, but in terms of quality, we believe American Gangster is the conceptually mastered version of Reasonable Doubt. Number four, Reasonable Doubt. Hey look, I don't know what to tell you. Jay's been doing this for 30 years, so if you thought we were going to have his debut at the top of the list, let's take a look at its competition. The Black Album is one of the best retirements we've seen in music. It's multifaceted and influential at every turn. With it fulfilling its outro duties better than Reasonable Doubt did on the debut side of things, it secures its spot in the top three. The Blueprint has a very strong case to be Jay's best album. Production, lyricism, influence, the album is Jay moving the culture at the peak of his brand. Now for arguably the most surprising pick on our list, 440. For. Yes, we know it's his most recent, but Hove's 10 track collection of memoirs is easily his most meaningful and cohesive release to date. We understand if it hasn't won you over in the six years since it dropped in 2017, but if you don't believe it's just ask Jay himself or Diddy or the handful of other icons in the game who already have Sean Carter's newest album at the top of their ranking. No spoilers here though, so keep watching. Embodying the idea of a quintessential 90s album, Jay's debut effort has been the center of discussion since dropping almost 30 years ago. When examining the albums, we consider to be classic Hove offerings, Reasonable Doubt is certainly the most inspired and the least innovative. None of that is to say it doesn't deserve its props. After all, it's number four on one of the most distinguished discographies in the genre's history. But this is also the most immature and unrefined version of Jay we'll probably ever hear. Sampling tried and true classics, New York State of Mind and Murder was the case on Dead Presidents 2 and The Evils respectively. Hove adds validity to Nas's remarks about being impressionable. He did make it a high song though. This isn't us discouraging the use of sampling is one of our favorite techniques, just emphasizing the prominent differences between this and his other classic works. Aside from his influence sound and occasionally choppy delivery, there's not much to nitpick. The production on this project is timeless. Ski, Primo, and Clark Kent bottled up 96 Brooklyn and gave it to us on a silver platter. Brooklyn's Finest is easily one of the most impactful collabs that doesn't get talked about enough, but the most overlooked aspect of the album has to be its storytelling. Just plug in tracks like Can I Live, Friend or Foe, and Regrets, and you'll see Jay has always meant to be one of the game's greats. With that being said, a couple of joints on here shouldn't have made the final cut, like Ain't No Nigga and Cashmere Thoughts, but with this being his debut, we can certainly forgive a skip or two. The album has immeasurable impact and easily houses some of his best material. We don't know what's more impressive, the fact that this was him hitting the ground running, or that he has several releases we feel are even better. Number three, 444. 12 albums in, Jigga had found repeated success with producers like Timberland, Kanye, Just Blaze, and Pharrell, but he never had someone single-handedly craft a project for him. Made in the Mist 
midst of a cheating scandal and elevator pay-per-view events, Jay put everything on the table with this 10-track LP. Understanding that he needed to pair this transparency and candidness with consistency, Hov locks in with no ID for the duration of this album's 36-minute runtime. Opening with Kill Jay-Z, Sean acknowledges that he needs to completely put his alter ego to rest before confronting the range of subjects he would address on the album. Themes would touch on everything from colorism and internalized hatred on the story of OJ to accumulating and managing generational wealth on legacy with no filler in between. A couple noteworthy features on this one, Frank Ocean, Damian Marley, and wife Beyonce all make appearances. Even Gloria Carter, his mom, makes her first return since the Black Album. 444's strength is its concise track list and steady quality throughout. If you wanted to argue Marcy Me was Ho's best song, we wouldn't be mad. Smile, Caught Their Eye, and Moonlight have to be some of the best album cuts we've heard from the Brooklyn vet. What kind of host would we be if we didn't talk about the title track though? Ho was in this existential bag for that one for sure. Despite being nominated for eight Grammys, the business mogul turned billionaire would walk away without a single trophy going 0 for 8, a crazy percentage for a legend like Ho. Paired with another unorthodox rollout, 444 was released through a partnership deal between Sprint and Tidal, only being available for their customers off the initial release. The first in a planned series of music exclusives, not really sure what that means, but we're excited to find out. The most difficult part of ranking this album is reconciling the amount of time we've had to sit with it. Even still, the impact can already be felt. Do you think we get Kendrick's double disc therapy session, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, if 444 never happened? Eh, maybe not. One of the things we particularly admired about the process of this album was how the beats came about. In an interview with Rap Radar's B-Dot and Elliot Wilson, Hove confirmed No ID already had the beats for Kill Jay-Z, Family Feud, and the title track 444. Jay brought Dion, aka No ID, a playlist of songs he was listening to at the time before getting to work and chopping them up. So in a sense, not only is this Jay's most personal project, it's also the only one he curated himself. What's that quote about art coming from pain? Here you have it. Number two, The Blueprint. This was a tough one. Since both number one and number two have interchangeable strengths, we told you this isn't your everyday ranking. Jay's 2001 LP was a historic release for the MC, dropping on one of the country's most chaotic days, no less. But that context only adds to the legend. With the majority of the album's 15 tracks being handled by Kanye, Just Blaze, and Bink, Jigga's blend of soul samples and drums revitalized hip hop in ways none of the other projects did. Stories about the album have reached mythical proportions, including the project's reported two week production time, with Jay allegedly recording nine songs in two days. We know you're wondering what could be keeping this one from the top spot on our list. Two words, hola ho vito. <laughs> No, we're kidding, it's more to the story, which we'll get into. We're just wondering if hindsight was necessary to know not to include Jigga That Nigga and the aforementioned Hola Ho Vito on the album's final cut. The Blueprint's release during one of hip hop's most storied beefs doesn't get the credit it deserves. Because while Jay goes over Nas's shaky release history following Illmatic, his wasn't looking that great either. I mean, we got one of his most pivotal projects in Reasonable Doubt, then three straight volumes of In My Lifetime and the Dynasty album. Needless to say, The Blueprint couldn't come at a better time. With both The Blueprint and Steelmatic proving to be their best projects in half a decade, is it safe to call this the most beneficial beef in hip hop? No deaths or physical altercations that we know about, just good old fashioned verbal assaults with no Vaseline. Like we said earlier, The Blueprint is exactly that. Jay's formulaic approach to lyrically, conceptually, and sonically overhaul how we approach hip hop. Reading over this track list, we would understand if you mistook it for greatest hits. Izzo, Girls, 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 You Don't Know, and Heart of the City are all unquestionable first ballad hall of fame hove. Can't forget essentials like Takeover, Song Cry, and Renegade. Damn, we just named the whole project. Aside from the three we already mentioned, Trackmasters, Timberland, and M would secure producer credits as well. With the latter being an exception, we think incorporating the other two was a disservice to the record. It disrupted the album's cohesion and further called Jay's ear for structuring into question. We'll get into why our number one locked its spot down, but culturalists, we got another head scratcher for you. If we split the album up in a versus platform, attributing Takeover, is and Heart of the City to Kanye, Girls, 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 You Don't Know and Song Cry to Just Blaze? Who you got on the production side? Let us know in the comments. Number one, The Black Album. We know you couldn't have predicted this one. After several mentions of retirement, the world thought Hove hung it up for good. If he had, we couldn't have been mad at what is arguably the most triumphant exit in music history. Keep in mind, he announced his departure after dropping arguably his worst album just over a year prior. Fans didn't really know what shape Hove would be in for this big finale, and they were not disappointed. Initially wanting to 
work with a different producer on every track, Jigga settled with assembling one of the greatest collections of musical talent behind the boards we've ever heard. Three songs from Just Blaze here, two from Kanye there, and additional contributions from Timbaland, the Neptunes, Rick Rubin, and the Buchanans, audiences can rest assured that Sean Carter spared no expense on the album's sound. Containing a sole feature from Pharrell, Jay didn't want to share his final curtain call with a plethora of other artists, and we certainly can't blame him. Taking it all the way back to the beginning, his eighth studio album starts his journey on December 4th, Hove's birthday. Likening himself to Gladiator, Hove reiterates that he's done battling for sport on What More Can I Say. We get the first of two Kanye beats with Encore, probably five songs too early, but still effective. Dirt Off Your Shoulder, 99 Problems, Public Service Announcement, Lucifer, bruh, Jay was going out with all haymakers. The Black Album thrives on finality and aspects none of his other works share. With his premature return from retirement, the album's impact on his legacy is unnecessarily complicated. Honestly, this one still had some wrinkles that should have been ironed out. Moment of Clarity sounds like an Eminem produced track and it's also aged like one. Thankfully, Hove's bars came to the rescue. Also, Justify My Thug had no business being in between public service announcement and Lucifer. Jay hadn't worked with Quick up until that point in his career and we don't know what made him start then. Threat really wasn't a bad song, but its placement on his last big hurrah and its incorporation of the Cedric skits just don't work for the overarching objective of the album. But let's not get it confused, Jay over delivered on every expectation placed on his shoulders. Despite our comparatively minor critiques of the album, Hove managed to exceed his own standards, drop classics with his most closely associated producers, and at least at the time, retire at the absolute peak of his craft. This one narrowly edges out the blueprint because of its versatility, refinement, and ability to get to the point. Coming into making the list, we were torn on whether the blueprint or 444 had a stronger argument at the top of his catalog, but honestly, it's hard to say that anything packs the punch that the Black Album bottled up in just under an hour. Any of his top three albums could have held this spot and we wouldn't have been mad. It just so happens, this one had us chanting for an encore. Hey, thanks for tuning in to this one, fam. You know we had to do it big for one of the game's greatest. Let us know down in the comments, do you agree? Or would have put the list in a different order? We think Hove deserves a thousand likes for his contributions to the culture. So run them numbers up and be sure to subscribe for more content just like this. I'm CJ Williams for CT and I'm out.